Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us with our second SPET support parent forum on reopening. My name is Dan Milgate, Superintendent of Schools, and I'd like to introduce to you our team who will be joining us today. Uh, over to my left, Ty Zinkowicz, our Assistant Superintendent for Instruction. Uh, to my right over here, Corey Allen, he's our Chief Information Officer. He oversees uh, a lot of our technology needs and, and, and work in that area, but he's also one of our task force chairs. Uh, Jonathan Salzberg behind me, he's our Executive Director of Operations and Special Projects, and he's also one of our task force chairs. Um, Megan Sarkis, one of our parent members on the task force for reopening, and then Tim O'Connor, our Director of Student Services, uh, responsible for a lot of our health-related programs and, and uh, scheduling and testing and things like that. So I would like to thank our district-wide reopening task force members, uh, the Board of Education and our administrative team for their tireless efforts in working on these plans. Um, as you know, details and logistics continue to be developed and adjusted um, made based on any new requirements we get from the Department of Education, the Department of Health, um, and the Governor's Office. Additionally, while we continue to provide Friday updates from the district and from each of our schools, we have also been making a coordinated effort to individually respond to as many questions and inquiries that we receive as possible. You will hear today how guidelines have changed even since our forum on Monday, uh, just with the Department of Health and some of our work in the area of health screening applications and protocols. As I shared during our introductions, a number of our task force members are here with us today. And a huge thank you to Megan Sarkis for joining us as one of our parent representatives. At this time, Megan will share some of her perspectives and experiences on with the update and the work on the task force. Megan. Thanks, Mr. Milgate. So being a member of the task force really allowed me the opportunity to see the many complexities behind the decision making. The task force members represented a very wide group of stakeholders and departments to ensure that all populations were represented and had a voice at the table. I truly felt that my perspective, not just as a parent, but also a full-time working parent, was welcomed and valued during these important discussions. In addition, responses from the parent and family surveys and the enrollment intent form helped to guide the work of the task force subcommittees. Concerns and suggestions from families were truly heard and addressed at every stage. And certainly as a parent, I realize that this is not a one size fits all solution, but I wanna assure fellow parents that every consideration was made to ensure the health and safety of our children while not compromising the high quality education that we've come to expect as spent support parents. This learning situation is absolutely not ideal for anyone this fall, but I truly have every confidence in our district administrators that they do have the best interest of our children as their highest priority. Certainly, I know a lot of questions still remain and the district continues to work tirelessly through them daily. And finally, one thing that's been abundantly clear to me throughout this process is that the situation continues to change at any time. And our, as parents, our ability to adapt and have faith in the district leaders and our children's teachers really will determine our success as parents to the children who are navigating this complex environment. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Megan. Uh, with that, I wanna thank each of you for reaching out to us again with questions and to thank our administrative team, especially our principals, for their continued commitment to this as well. Uh, we've been collating our questions from Monday and updating our frequently asked questions page on the website and have administrators reaching out to parents as much as possible as well with questions that were not answered at, on Monday. Um, we also continue to um, do that after our forum today. We'll work on those again and in the coming weeks to make sure we're still building that frequently asked question page. So, Corey, if we can move to the um, back to the PowerPoint. So the purpose of these forums is to continue to provide everyone with as much information as possible. Our forums will be one hour each with three 20 minute segments, as you can see up here on the screen, uh, divided as follows. We'll, be, we'll provide this like we're doing now, a general update and overview of where we're at. Answer questions submitted to us in advance from parents. 
uh, with my colleagues that are here with me today. And then lastly, respond to as many of our live chat questions as possible and as time permits. Uh, for this segment, Mr. Allen uh, will be monitoring the chat room Zoom and will read your questions to our participants here on the forum and we will provide answers. Our goal is to get through as many of those questions as possible that are posed today. And if we are not able to do that, we will include those along with other questions asked in advance with our, on our website. Uh, we will combine similar questions today and, and same on our FAQ page for efficiency. So uh, please understand that when we're trying to answer those. Um, at each of these forums, even though they're going to be similar, they will be different with the chat questions. So we just want you aware of that as well. Um, on the next slide, Corey. So I just want you to be aware, this is the location on the website where you can find those changes. And please note, we are also recording this forum as well as Mondays and the other ones today and next week to post on our website for anyone that is unable to attend. We have categorized our questions in the health and safety operations and instruction, as you can see here on our webpage. Um, and we will be adding to our category soon just because of the additional questions we're getting and, and the kind of the buckets that they fall into. And as a reminder, along with today, we do have two additional parent forum dates and time schedules as opportunities for you. We have one more today at 4 p.m. And we also plan one for next week with our building principals on August 26th as we anticipate more details will be available at that point with schedules and logistics and many of the procedures that uh, we're working on every day that Megan talked about a little while ago. Um, this will take place at 6 p.m. next week and we're, right now our plan is to have a format where we go elementary then secondary. So we're leaving that little gap there just for time to adjust in case parents wanted to be on only for an elementary portion or only for a secondary portion. So if we can go back to our live view. Um, to begin today's session, I would like to share some general comments first with respect to the work we need to complete in the coming weeks to be prepared to open schools for our students and staff. Please know that our number one priority, uh, again, as, Me as Megan not mentioned so kindly, is the safety of all members of our learning community. And to that end, we will provide answers to many of the questions that were posed around protocols and systems that we will put in place with safety in mind. With so many procedures being developed, another key area of focus is for us is that training, the workshops, the informational learning videos that we'll talk about in a minute, and constant communication, including the signage efforts to ensure that all students, staff, and visitors are aware of the expectations that we will have. A major, a major reason we changed the beginning of our school year that first week to conference phase was to ensure that we had the time needed to do a lot of that work. And along with that, we are working with our administrative team on putting in the supervision and reinforcement efforts needed um, when we get back to school. So many of the questions that have been posed are related to these efforts and you will hear more about today. And uh, what we'd like to do at this point is um, go back to our presentation and um, we're going to show you a little vignette of an example of some of the work we're doing to make sure that people have the opportunity uh, to be well informed and, and see what things will look like as well. Okay, keep talking. Okay. Uh, right now, we're not able to show the video. It's not sharing, so we, we'll go back to it if we can. I apologize for that, but what I would like to do is uh, share that the video we were going to show was an example of one of these vignettes, um, and, and now it's going to work. So... <laughs> Okay, sorry about the technical glitch there. I want to thank our team of administrators and faculty that coordinated this effort, and especially our student actors. 
Um, but this is an example of that effort we're trying to make sure that we have in place for visuals and, and safety protocols being uh, able to be taught to everyone. Um, so we'll have a series of these and we'll have more on, in areas like entering into our buildings or the hallway movement, transportation, hygiene, uh, cafeterias, um, and even our screening health check. So one of the most frequently asked questions that we received this past week was answered with the remote and hybrid group placements that were announced last Friday. Parents may find those placements in the campus backpack section of our infinite campus on the uh, parent portal. Once we received those intent forms last Monday um, electronically, um, we just needed a few days to process through that and then eventually we sent out those notices. If you need any assistance with how to access these pages, tutorials may be found on the main page of the website along with contact information for individuals that will provide support. In addition, any individual question should be directed to your, your uh, building principal. Please remember that while we are reviewing extenuating circumstances with grouping placements with our principals, our decisions are influenced by maintaining a balanced level of students in our classrooms, the buses, and all that with safety and social distancing in mind. And as we mentioned earlier in that video show, that's a good example of we only have so much space in a room to maintain social distancing, so how do we do that? Related to that common question, another question that many of you have asked, and it revolves around the ability to change from the full remote to the hybrid model or from the hybrid model to full remote. Prior to that October 30th date that we talked about is a date that we set in order for us to plan properly. Again, to ensure student safety, our classrooms and buses need to be balanced to support the social distancing guidelines. With that in mind, unless the situation is really extenuating, it, and, and we can still meet the guidelines if we do make a change, we will not be able to honor changes from remote to hybrid. From going from hybrid to remote is a little bit easier for us, so in most cases we'll be able to approve those. As we move into the next segment of this forum, I wanna thank you again for submitting your questions in advance. Because many of you submitted similar questions, we will focus on answering those questions first and to begin with, so many of our questions revolve around the availability of technology and the use of those resources in our hybrid and remote learning models. We wanted to answer some of those questions. I would like to introduce Corey Allen, who will run through some of the important updates regarding our connectivity and our resources, and will address many of the questions in this area. To begin with, what he's gonna do is uh, provide an example of how quickly things changed even since Monday with an update on our daily health screening process with a little mini demonstration for you. Thank you very much, Mr. Milgate. As Mr. Milgate alluded, we wanted to show you today just a quick demonstration of the help screen tool that we will be using for our students as well as our staff members. This health screener will be accessed through emails and or text messages that are sent out each and every morning. So what you're looking at currently is an actual um, demonstration of the live screener that we're currently testing with our administrators. So I received this, this email today prompting me to complete the health screener. After the opening page, it's going to ask me if I will come on campus today. I am on campus, so I click yes. Clicking no will end the experience for me and take me to the last page. Giving consent to fill out the form. Clicking yes will move me forward. No to, no to decline is going to give me a not certified screen that I am not certified to come to school today or to come onto campus as I have not provided the information necessary. Clicking into the next, next, I just have to acknowledge my telephone number. And then asking the very first question, if I have chills or a fever greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If I click yes, it is going to take me to a not certified page. And it is also gonna prompt me on what I need to do next for my own health and safety. Uh, as well as what I would need to do as a staff member uh, for the district or a student um, at all levels. 
So I do not have shows. I apologize. I, I apologize. I'm very sorry that you were not able to see that. We'll we'll run back through this um, uh, in a second. Just thank you very much for your patience. Again, I apologize. So with this section asking me a, a number of questions, again, all of the questions that are um, aligned to symptoms of COVID, sore throat and loss of taste or smell. If I click none of these and now go forward, I receive my uh, approval and the certification that I am, uh, I am um, okay to come on to campus. Again, as students, this will be pushed out to uh, families, to parents via email and text messages. Um, and we are now currently, as I stated, working with our administrators to test this uh, before rolling it out to our staff and to our community at large. Again, I apologize for the, um, for the technical difficulties and we'll bring us back for the technology questions that were, were received via our last form, as well as, as emails to the district. The first question, are all students getting upgraded laptops? Students at grades K-5 will be, will be asked to return their current laptops in exchange for updated devices. So if students at K-5 received a device in the spring, they'll be asked to return that device, and they will get a new device. To be clear, all K-5 students will receive their own device this year. Students entering grades six and nine will also receive updated laptops, while grades six, eight, 10, 11, and 12 will keep their existing laptops that were assigned. We will be communicating via the building level, distribution schedules for our students who will be receiving new and updated laptops. Next question, is Wi-Fi available for remote instruction days? We have worked as a district to identify families who have indicated on the enrollment intent form that they do not have Wi-Fi, and then working with those families to ensure that they have Wi-Fi in their homes. Will students need a printer at home? No, students will not need a printer in their household. The majority of the work will be in digital format. Will new laptops be issued to eighth graders? Eighth graders will not receive new laptops. The district will issue new devices at grades six and nine in the secondary level. Would the district put a link to the technology help desk on the homepage, please? Families can contact the help desk at 349-5106. This number has been added to the district homepage. And Mr. Milgate, again, as you stated earlier, we have consolidated many of those questions that were similar, and those are the questions that were involved around technology. Right, and, I, and uh, thank you, Corey. Also, uh, those vignettes we were talking about, and the one we were able to show, um, those are, that's an example. We'll have one out there as well about the daily health screening as well. So uh, next, what I'd like to do is introduce Jonathan Salzberg. He will share some of the important questions that you posed and that involve our operations departments uh, things like general safety protocols, our lunch programs, transportation, and masking. Thank you, Mr. Milgate. Yeah. Uh, we've received a number of questions that affect departments under the operations umbrella. For instance, we received a couple of questions about cleaning, barriers, and social distancing, which I'll address first. First question is, does the district have enough supplies on hand to meet requirements for a period of time cleaning supplies, staff PPE, and other disinfectant materials? Our parent survey indicated that 98% of parents will be able to provide a face covering for their child. Though we have this data, we are following SED guidance and have ordered an eight-week supply of needed PPE for students and staff relevant to their positions, and these items are already arriving. The district also has cleaning supplies and hand sanitizer on hand to supply the buildings through December. Next question. I understand there is a deep cleaning on Wednesday, but what about between the two groups between Monday and Tuesday? 
Rather than limit cleaning to one deep clean on Wednesdays, we will actually be doing a deep clean every evening. The cleaning staff will circulate through the building and disinfect touch surfaces such as desks using a Protexis electrostatic sprayer or similar method. Cleaning staff will also circulate through the building cleaning high touch surfaces and restrooms periodically through the day and in the evening when the building is empty. Will there be plexiglass in between student desks? Furniture will be arranged so that six foot of social distancing is maintained in all directions between student desks and the teacher's desks. However, the district has ordered clear plastic barriers for use if it is determined that an enrolled class size requires desks closer than six feet. And we've also ordered a barrier for use across elementary student tables. What steps have you taken to ensure social distancing is maintained in the hallways, especially during class transitions or in high traffic areas? Floor decals with arrows, bright tape, and distance reminders, along with posters and signage, will be placed throughout our buildings to guide travel patterns and encourage social distancing from students. Moving on to the issues of face coverings and masks, there were a number of questions around our expectations of all staff and student wearing masks. I would also note that in our website FAQ, we have already indicated that masks will be required at all times, even during instruction. How will mask wearing be enforced? We are currently updating our code of conduct and its adoption is pending board approval. The district intends to offer trainings about mask, ex mask expectations and reinforcement when staff report back to work and in the initial days of return to school. Will students and staff be given mask breaks and what will they look like? We understand the importance of mask breaks and are currently working on plans for implementation. Once established, we will make sure we provide training for staff and students about the breaks and ensure we are still adhere adhering to the information from the Departments of Health. We will keep you updated as we know more. Will students wear masks in physical education? Yes, students will be required to wear masks during physical education and they will have the opportunity for mask breaks periodically during the class. PE classes scheduled outside will allow for more flexibility in mask breaks. Will face shields be permitted in place of face coverings in order to provide a break once seated and socially distanced? No, current guidance is that face shield, a face shield is insufficient to protect the wearer from exposure without a proper face covering. Similarly, a face shield is considered insufficient to protect others without a suitable face covering. That being said, face shields will be allowed when used over an acceptable face covering. Uh, for the next topic, we received a number of questions about our HVAC systems and ventilation. Do classrooms, hallways, gymnasiums all have HVAC systems that meet the new standards? The New York State Department of Health guidance provided to the district only indicates that we should increase outside air as much as possible while maintaining health and safety protocols. The district has evaluated all HVAC systems and those systems will be set to maximize fresh air intake for the outside temperatures. Do all windows open and will they, will they be open to assist with ventilation? Most classrooms across the district have functional windows in which staff are encouraged to open to improve ventilation unless this introduces a health and safety risk such as allergies or a potential fall. Will the use of fans be permitted in the fall? Our current understanding is that fans may only be used to exhaust air to the outside and not as a means of blowing air across people as this could spread the virus. However, we have submitted this question to the New York State Education Department for further guidance. We also received a, a couple questions about transportation, uh, which as uh, Mr. Allen indicated, have been consolidated here. But when will we be notified of the school bus schedules? The transportation department is currently creating the school bus routes and the times will be communicated when the bus passes are sent out. This process has been delayed due to the creation of the hybrid system student groupings. We will get these out as soon as possible. Will remote families be able to request bus transportation in October if changing to hybrid or full in-person instruction? Yes, we will be developing a survey or process in early October for parents to complete, allowing enough time for transportation department to balance and reroute the buses as needed. And finally, I have a couple questions on lunches and the lunchroom. Where will middle school students eat? Will student seating be spaced out and what will the room look like? 
Each building is laying out furniture to maximize student seating while still maintaining six feet of social distancing in all directions. This will affect each building differently. For example, at the high school, the plan is to have seating in the West Cafeteria and the West Gymnasium so as to have enough seating during the lunch period. The middle school will use the cafeteria and seats will be spaced six feet apart and clearly marked for students. At the elementary level, the buildings are laying out tables and reconsidering lunch timing so that students will be able to eat in lunch in the cafeteria. Students will be able to speak to one another, but spacing will remain at six feet, so barriers would not be required. Thank you, Mr. Mogan. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, we, we fully expected that a number of our questions would be around the areas of health and safety of our students and the scheduling process and, and so on, and protocols really influenced by the Department of Health regulations. So thank you for those questions. Mr. O'Connor, we'll review some of those now for you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Milgate. Uh, and as I mentioned during the community forum on Monday, uh, we truly appreciate the thoughtful questions from the community focused on health and safety and the opportunity to answer these questions uh, more so in more depth this morning. As we have engaged in conversations with the reopening task force, and other members of our learning community, we have seen themes around health and safety questions and have made an effort to answer those common questions on the website. Our hope is to provide additional clarity uh, on those questions that were posed Monday and throughout the week. Additionally, since our last forum, we have received additional guidance from the, from the Monroe County Department of Health, and I will capture that new information uh, in our responses to some of these commonly asked questions. So we received a number of questions around the symptoms uh, and the symptoms related to COVID-19 uh, and how they align to our screening questions. So this question reads, what happens when a student who has seasonal allergies exhibits a runny nose or a cough, but does not exhibit any other symptoms? Based on the New York State and the Monroe County Department of Health guidance, when a student presents with symptoms consistent with COVID-19 during a health screen or when a student presents with these symptoms requiring them to visit the nurse's office, unless the district has documentation from a provider regarding a chronic illness that aligns to those symptoms, the child must be isolated and sent home. If there is not documentation of a chronic illness and the child is required to be sent home, the child cannot return to school without, at minimum, documentation from the healthcare provider a negative COVID-19 test and symptom resolution. Uh, the next question is around a teacher or student testing positive for COVID-19. So the question is what happens if a teacher or student tests positive for COVID? The good news is that we're very fortunate to have a very great partnership, a very positive partnership with the Monroe County Department of Health. And if we do receive the unfortunate news that a student or staff member has tested positive with COVID-19, the Monroe County Department of Health will take the lead on the school district's response to a positive test. Obviously, the district will collaborate with the Department of Health on contact tracing, quarantine, and isolation efforts, but it is the Department of Health that will respond and perform the thorough investigation of the confirmed COVID case. Uh, this includes evaluating each COVID-19 positive uh, case excuse me, each positive result on a case-by-case -case basis and providing recommendations to the district regarding the plan of action. Recommendations could include, but are not limited to, the immediate closure of a classroom, of a school building, or the district for 24 hours or more. Uh, the, the Department of Health will notify the superintendent or designated personnel for all mandatory quarantines of students, staff, and faculty after notifying uh, the individual or family first. We received questions about medical exemptions for masks. And this, the answers to these questions came with some of the new guidance from the Department of Health that we received this week. A mask exemption form has been developed by the Monroe County Department of Health. And it's currently being distributed to physicians in an effort to provide consistency in the Finger Lakes region. It can only be completed by a New York State licensed physician, a nurse practitioner or MD, a physician's assistant, or a licensed clinical psychologist. And currently, the only acceptable diagnosis to justify a mass exemption include the following. 
a previously documented neuromuscular disorder that makes it difficult for a child to remove the mask themselves, a child with a previously diagnosed severe developmental or behavioral problem, a child with a diagnosis of serious emotional disturbance or other significant mental health problem, currently in the care of a behavioral health team, and it is believed that by this team, wearing a mask would lead to a worsening emotional harm. Uh, if the district receives the medical mask exemption form from a physician, it will be reviewed and accepted or not accepted based upon the direction of the district's medical director. We additionally received some questions about student schedules uh, and the grouping of students in the blue and gold group. So the question was, what is the process that was used to create the blue and gold group in the hybrid learning model? So as was mentioned, the district used the enrollment intent form to survey the community and determine students who were selected for remote learning model and the hybrid model. Once our remote learning students were identified and we placed students in the Spencerport and Ranger group based upon their academic program, this left the students who needed to be scheduled in the blue and gold hybrid group. We then used Infinite Campus to balance the blue and gold group to keep siblings in the same household together so that they could attend school on the same day. To do this, Infinite, Camp excuse me, Infinite Campus balanced each seat in each course section or classroom. So if a family has siblings in multiple schools, the oldest student would be balanced first, and this could be up to eight sections at the secondary level. And then the younger students were attached and balanced from there. This was done in an effort to maintain smaller groups to assist with us adhering to social distancing guidelines uh, within the classroom and on the school bus. So with that, once again, thank you. And we appreciate your questions that you have shared. And please continue to use the district websites to access those frequently asked questions. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, I, I did make a mistake. I forgot to welcome and thank our interpreter, Ms. Blauser. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, at this time, what I'll be doing is introducing Mr. Zinkowicz. He'll provide a summary of the questions uh, that were asked that are related to the instructional program and delivery of services in our hybrid and remote learning models. Uh, this is, we know this is a huge part of um, what you're interested in, and we're diligently working on this with our administrative team, the teachers union, and, and all those important de details with our instructional models. So uh, we're going to switch over to our PowerPoint again, and Mr. Zinkowicz is going to use that for um, the uh, beginning. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You're going to... Not yet. Not yet. If yeah. you can hold off on that for one second. Sorry. All right. Thank you, Mr. Milligate. Um, so as you know, we are required to submit a plan to our state education department that included full return, hybrid, and distance learning for our remote students. Um, although many questions have been posed, my purpose today is just to provide an overview of our approach and may not be able to answer specific questions at this time. So as you know, when it comes to curriculum, instruction, and assessment, curriculum is what we teach, instruction is how we teach it, that assessment involves how we monitor student progress for the confines of the school year. So we need to ensure with both our remote and hybrid models that we have adhered to curriculum maps so that all of our students are on the same page. This impacts students from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. So we're working with our teachers right now, we'll continue to work with them to ensure that all of our students, doesn't matter if they select remote, or hybrid, that everyone's on the same page. So when we look at our remote students, we had about 15% of families select this option. As Mr. O'Connor just mentioned, we then removed those students from our equation when we selected the blue and gold groups. A question was posed about the school hours for the upcoming school year. Our school hours will remain the same. High school will begin at 7.25. The school day will end at 2.10. Cosgrove Middle School will begin at 8 a.m. The school day will end at 2.50. At the elementary level, school day will remain at 9 a.m. and will end at 3.30 p.m. Questions were posed about orientation. 
as you know, our transition years, kindergarten, sixth grade, and ninth grade. So for our sixth grade and ninth grade freshman orientation, the question was asked if it would be held in person or virtually. Both orientations will be held in person. Students will attend in small groups to ensure social distancing, and more information will be communicated next week. There will also be an option for our remote learners to access this information virtually. Will kindergarten orientation be held in person or virtually? The elementary principals are working on logistics for our kindergarten orientation and details will be released shortly. We ask that for parents of kindergartners that you hold the dates of September 10th and September 11th on your calendars as this is when our orientation will take place. A question was asked, will hybrid and remote students have the same teacher for instruction? Elementary students will not have the same instructor, but secondary students in grades six through 12 may have the same teacher. Now, as we transition to remote and hybrid models, question was asked, will remote students have specific times to be on Zoom for live teaching during school days? Yes, it is our hope to release more details and plans in the coming days but all of our students in some capacity will have live instruction if they so choose. Will remote students be able to get help or tutoring with the teacher if needed? As you may recall, we asked families to respond to a distance learning survey in the spring. And the feedback that we received was families wanted their child to have more access to their teacher. As a result, yes, we'll be offering hours and times for students to access their teacher if they select the remote or even if they're not in the building for our hybrid students. It's important also right now for us just to talk about synchronous and asynchronous learning. I'm gonna ask Mr. Allen just to show a slide because this will impact all of our students in some capacity. So synchronous learning occurs live. Our students are learning at the same time Communication can happen in real time. Is our hope that is more engaging and effective and allows the individuals to see what is taking place from their assigned teacher. Asynchronous learning though, happens at a different time. So for example, if an elementary family selected the remote option and their child in daycare during the day will not have access to a computer. They will have access to the asynchronous model in our Schoology courses for them to receive the same information. This allows for convenience and flexibility based on the structure of the family. Now, if we turn to the hybrid model, we'd like to just show you what the schedule will look like in terms of the rotation. We have three different models, kindergarten through fifth grade for our elementary students, sixth through eighth, and then nine through 12th. This is for our hybrid learners. So when school opens on Monday, September 14th, students will then have an A day. At the elementary level, we follow a five day rotation. And those rotations and those letter days are based when students have their special. So within that five day rotation, students receive physical education twice, art once, music once, and then depending on the grade level, they will receive either instructional technology support through our enrichment specialists or literacy support through our school librarians. So these letter days correspond to the specials that students experience. You will see here that our blue students, those individuals in the blue group, will have an A day on the 14th and a B day on September 17th. Those days when students are not in school under the hybrid model, they will receive independent work, work that will be available in Schoology, virtual work, and perhaps access to their teacher. Moving to the middle school, 
They also follow a five-day rotation. And you will see here that new instruction will occur Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. That will continue. And we will place a calendar up until January 29th, which is the first semester at the secondary level. Where it says E1 and E2, once again, that's based on some of the special classes that our Cosgrove students take. But students will receive new instruction each day. That's why it's important that either synchronous or asynchronous, students will have access to their instruction either live or if it's not convenient for them, they'll have access via their Schoology course. At the high school level, we follow a four-day rotation. And you can see here that our blue group, so students that attend Mondays and Thursdays, for week one, they will be in their AB classes because the majority of our classes go on opposite days. So students either have AC or BD schedules. Science is the one exception, along with physical education. So week two, the students in the blue group will have their C and D day classes. And the impetus behind this is to allow students to work directly with their teacher, every teacher, at least once a week. Wednesdays, students will receive independent work. They may have access to their teacher. And they'll also have virtual lessons for them to complete. Thank you, Mr. Allen, for showing that. Now, some of the other questions based on the hybrid model. Will kids stay in their classroom for instruction and teachers move from class to class? Or will there be transition? This is specifically asked for elementary students. Our K-5 students will remain in their classroom and their special area teacher will travel to their class. Secondary students will be traveling throughout the school day. Our estimated class sizes range anywhere from 10 to 15 students. And this depends on the size of the room and our ability to balance schedules and sections. Will students have band and course at the secondary level? Yes. Currently, we're exploring the use of auditorium to cause within the high school in order to accommodate this and ensure that we maintain social distancing of 12 feet. What is the status of our Wamoko classes? This information will be shared next week in terms of the specific details for students that have selected Wamoko. When will we be receiving the daily schedule for hybrid elementary learners? Once again, that schedule, once students arrive in school on either the blue group or the gold group, they will follow the traditional schedule involving ELA, math, etc. Relative to the drop off and pickup, will children be able to arrive to school early and how will this work? Although we're trying to minimize before and after school activities, we're working on the logistics and trying to spread them out in order to ensure social distancing. Our main goal is to make sure supervision is available and that we maintain health and safety for all involved. What is the process for remote students to receive school materials such as books, packets, and worksheets? The district is making every effort to limit the amount of tangible materials as much as possible. Principals will set up times for pickup and delivery over the next few weeks and will provide information on a case-to-case -case basis. We have transition now to some of the special education questions that we receive. If a student with an IEP in a general classroom has adult support for instructional purposes, will they have access to their assigned adult on days that they are not in school? These adults will be familiar with the modification differentiation that is used within their classroom. Students have access to their special education teachers and related service providers in school and virtually based on their individual needs as outlined in their IEP. The special education providers will ensure that students are provided with accommodations and specifically designed instruction in both settings as well. 
If students have teacher assistance as part of their educational program, those individuals will be receiving support from both their special education teacher and teaching assistants. Question was asked, how can you provide IEP service if my child is all online? All services for students who are participating in virtual learning will participate in telepractice and teletherapy modes of instruction. Students will have access to their special education teachers, case managers, and related service providers on a regular basis based on their individual needs as outlined in their IEP. As the school year begins, case managers will be reaching out to work with families on specific schedules. Thank you very much, Mr. Melgate. I'd like to turn it over to you if I could. Can you see this or no? Okay. Uh, thanks, Mr. Zankiewicz. I, I know that's a lot of information, everyone, and yet it, you still probably have questions. Uh, as a reminder, principals and directors will continue to reach out to parents. And if at any time you have a question, be sure to reach out to your building principal. Um, at this time, I would ask that Corey Allen provide a quick summary of how we'll work through the question and answer summary part with our chat room here on Zoom. Again, we will collect all of these questions and we'll combine them with our other frequently asked questions on our webpage. And to be respectful of your time, when we get closer to the end, um, Mr. Allen will kind of give us an indicator of when we're going to end. Mr. Allen? Thank you very much, Mr. Milgan. I want to thank everyone for putting their question and answers into our chat function. We are going to go down our questions. It looks like we have roughly 50 right now to take a look at each one of those uh, questions and try to answer those in the best way that we can. Um, so we'll start with um, just the first question. Um, will children receive their laptops before the school starts? If not, what are the golden children expected to do on the first days of school when they, when they won't go for in-person until Tuesday? So it is true that our deployment of devices for our students who are on the hybrid model will take place in their first in their first um, in person class with their teachers. We can pause here. This is not letting me scroll down. Sorry, I apologize. Would you do the next question, Mr. Lindbergh? Absolutely. Uh, so the question is. When do you anticipate class lists to be sent out for hybrid students? Um, we're trying to minimize the amount of materials that are brought into school, but those class lists will be sent out next week by our building principals. Next question, when will families receive a schedule slash expectations for remote learning, especially for students working fully remote? Once again, that information will be available next week as well. Question for the three days students do online classes, are these courses instructor led? Right now we're just finalizing the details when it comes to that, but a portion of that will be independent. Okay, uh, so there's a question in the chat. How will parents be notified if a teacher or student comes in contact um, with their child uh, that is granted a, a mass exemption? Uh, so, again, uh, following HIPAA law and HIPAA regulations, we would not be able to share those individuals who. Uh, would potentially receive, uh, receive uh, a, a mask exemption so that we would not be able to share any other medically uh, related information. Will water bottles be allowed? Yes, water bottles uh, will. Excuse me, there's a, a question in the chat about uh, water bottles and, and water breaks. Uh, water bottles will be allowed uh, and uh, using mass breaks to, to allow students to take take a drink of their water bottle uh, will also be included in some of the training that's provided to, uh, to faculty and staff. John, do you want to speak to the paper cups of the water bottle? Yes, uh, in addition to what uh, Tim just shared, we are currently converting most, or most if not all water fountains over to bottle fillers. So it will be likely be in our FAQ, but we do suggest that students uh, procure a um, 
a, a personal water bottle. In cases where a student does not have a water bottle, we will also have paper cups near the water fountain so that students do not have to um, uh, use it as a traditional water fountain. We also have a question about acceptable face masks. And uh, a neighboring district posted some information about that. Uh, as we get more information on that, we'll send that out, but we're actually researching that today. Um, and again, we'll keep putting that updated information out there about uh, any kind of uh, safety or precautionary safety measures on our web page. We also have a question, how will the school meet the requirements for services outlined in their child's IEP? Consultant teacher services and related services will be prioritized when students are in school. Uh, during the days students are working remotely, they will have access to their special education teachers, case managers, therapists, and the motor support may differ based on the individual needs. If therapies are not delivered in the school setting, they will be delivered remotely or via a teletherapy model. There, there's an actual question about if we believe we'll be back full time. Uh, folks, that's our hope for all of us, so we don't actually know. Uh, but if we do, we're trying to build our systems now so that we can make that easy transition. So uh, that's a tough one to answer, but it's a great question and actually what we all hope for. Um, at the same time, um, there was a question earlier on there that was similar. It was about if we go to full remote. Um, again, as we're designing our current plans, we want to be ready to go to full remote immediately. And that's something that we will do um, and we'll communicate to the on our webpage with a full remote plan here coming up soon. Looks like there's also a question about why isn't all hybrid learning synchronous? And again, it's not really one size fits all and every family situation is unique. So for example, some children may be in a daycare during those uh, remote days or with a grandparent or with an older sibling. So that presents challenges to have them log on at a specific time, which is why as Mr. Zinkovich alluded to, recordings will be made available. So for example, when the parent returns home from work or picks the child up from daycare, they can then access the content that was covered that day. And also at the elementary level, uh, a question was posed about the goal group. Uh, what will be the expectations for those students since they may not have access to their a laptop? We'll then defer that instruction until Tuesday, September 15th, which will be the first day of instruction. There was a, a question about what factors uh, will determine going to a full remote learning model. Um, that decision could be the result of an executive order from the governor's office. Uh, related to the current infection rate within our region or across the street, uh, or based upon uh, a decision made from the Department of Health. There's also a question on school student schedules. Should we go to a full remote model? There's our hope to provide a truncated version of the student's current schedule, meaning shortened, so that they can wor work both remotely through a synchronous approach and also remotely through an asynchronous approach. There was a question for transportation about the cleaning of buses. Our plan is for uh, buses to be cleaned after each morning route and after each afternoon route. And twice a week, they will be sprayed down with the same Protexas sprayer that we are using in the classrooms. There was also a question around uh, PPE uh, and specifically gowns uh, as it relates to PPE and who would, we, who would be wearing gowns. Uh, again, according to, to state ed guidance, uh, the individuals who may be wearing a gown are those who may come in high intensity contact uh, with a student or an individual handling waste. So examples of that would include uh, the nurses, uh, the custodian, or some special education teachers. There's a question about Wednesdays and the plan for Wednesdays. We're still working on the details involving Wednesdays. However, we need to be respectful of those families that selected the remote option. And as I mentioned earlier, when we look at our curriculum maps, we need to ensure that all of our students are on the same page based on the information, the content that they receive. 
And so although there may not be the same format on Wednesday, students will still be required to complete tasks, to receive instruction, and to be held somewhat accountable for their attendance on Wednesdays as well. Just as a time check, uh, Mr. Zinkovich, we have about five more minutes to the end of the meeting. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question around when will elementary students get their teacher placement? We're actually timeline wise, it would have been this week typically, uh, but we need another week or so to just fine tune uh, what Mr. Zinkovich just mentioned about schedules, uh, the number of kids that are remote and how that impacts our balance of our section. So we hope to have that out to you next week. Question was asked about training of students. So this training based on some of the protocols that Mr. Milgate referenced, i.e. hand washing, social distancing, wearing a face mask, et cetera. This information will be shared with students on their first day of school. We want to make sure that all of our students are fully aware of the expectations involving their health and safety and the steps that we need to take in order to guarantee or support overall personal wellness. Um, the, the question that's posted about the, um, the information that came out in the news this morning, the financial information, uh, it's a little early for me to predict will that have an impact or not on our current budget. We actually are looking into that and we'll give you an update on that as soon as we can. Uh, but that's something that, um, is, that's an example of how things are changing so fast, I guess I would share. Question was posed about spring versus now this 2021 school year in terms of assessment. As I mentioned at the beginning, curriculum, instruction, and assessment are the three tenets of the work that we're doing with our students. In the spring, we provided feedback to students. We kind of paused grading or providing them an actual score. That will not be the case for the 2021 school year. We'll need to assign assignments that will be graded, that will incur, involve at all grade levels. Uh, Jonathan, you want to answer the question about emergency drills? Yes. Uh, the district is still required to conduct emergency drills in every building. Uh, there will be at least eight drills conducted before December and then another four in the spring that is uh, typical of what we do. But the state has allowed us to modify those drills. Those modifications could include um, staggering student exiting by class or other methods that the, the buildings will be allowed to implement to ensure social distancing during those drills. Uh, good question about visitors. Uh, the question is, will visitors be allowed in the buildings? Uh, we actually shared this in our last forum. We are limiting that unless it's a, a necessity and the principals will kind of monitor that. Um, again, it's just, it's about the safety of the buildings and trying to minimize our numbers. Thank you. With that, we have time for maybe uh, one more question or we'll wrap it up, Mr. Milgate, with uh, the next dates for um, forms. Sure. There, there are a few questions here we haven't answered, but again, it's, uh, it's those questions that we'll have to get back to you or the principals will get back to you. And um, what I do is, uh, what I'd like to do at this time is uh, just a reminder that our upcoming forum dates are uh, later today, actually, at 4 p.m., to 5 p.m. And then next week on the 26th, we've changed the format of that. The, uh, the actual time is gonna be 6 to 8 p.m. And we are asking that uh, elementary has the approximately 6 o'clock to 6.55, and then we'll do secondary from 7.05 to 8 o'clock. And that's so that the parents that don't have elementary or, or, or secondary students can choose what segment they wanna be a part of. Um, so in addition, uh, we ask that you, um, you know, you, you keep going to that frequently asked web page, or you uh, continue to send in any questions you have on, at the info at spetsupportschools.org web page, or again, contact your principal. So uh, what I'd like to do at this time is thank each of our panelists for being a part of this, you guys, I appreciate it. Um, and thank all of you for joining us. 
We appreciate your questions, uh, your feedback, and your patience. Uh, as we prepare for the opening of schools this year, we know school will look different, um, but please know that the health and safety of the students and families and staff is absolutely our top priority. You can continue to submit questions to our uh, webpage like we shared or contact your building principals. And we appreciate you again for joining us today. Thank you.